this edition of the Farrell Phelps Show. We're on location with none other than Miss Mary Griffin. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I was really looking forward to this interview. It was great that I had a chance to speak with you last night and I learned so much more about who Mary Griffin is. Wonderful. And you know, I was really fascinated because I've known you forever as a vocalist, uh, but I didn't realize how many layers were attached to Mary Griffin. I want to start with your early childhood. Um, now, you're the daughter of a minister, preacher, preacher yes. and you are actually from New Orleans, right? I'm actually from North Louisiana. From North Louisiana. I came here during Katrina and stayed. Came here during Katrina and stayed? Yeah, um, I was living in New Orleans at the time. Mm -hmm. So, I ended up coming here like the rest of the people did, driving for 21 hours. And uh, once I got here, they had a major airport. And it's an international airport, so uh -huh. I just said, why not just stay? <laughs> so, <laughs> slept in my car for a couple of weeks. Really? Well, when I came here, I was homeless. Everybody that was going to get a hotel got it prior to the storm. And okay. um, I left the last day um, mm. before the storm hit. And I had a show, well, actually a recording session to do for Patti LaBelle in L.A., and uh, that was my first show back with her after a year and a half. Okay. And so, um, a gig. It wasn't a show. Uh -huh. It was a gig. <laughs> and the gig was to actually go in the studio and record the background vocals for her. Um, um, shows that we do that are not with the band. And so the okay. background, you know, the tracks uh -huh. that she needs, we had to go in and do the background tracks. The background and so tracks. I okay. drove 21 hours out of there. And got here, had no more brakes by the time I got to the airport. I burnt my brakes out because it was like <laughs> this the whole time coming here for 21 hours. And you know it only takes five hours to get here. Yeah, and it was 21 hours. 21 hours of braking and, you know, people coming here, you know. Yeah. And I saw some horrendous things uh, on the side of the road, things that were humble you yeah. for the rest of your life. It was a life-changing experience. Right. And I know it was a life-changing experience for many people. Uh, the Katrina catastrophe yeah. uh, was, was really something else. I want to, uh, we'll come back to mm -hmm. you getting into Houston, but I want to go back into your early childhood. Okay. And how you actually got into music. Now, your father uh, is, is a great influence and was a great influence for you. Yes. Um, I have three sisters that sing. So, I grew up with a, a wonderful dad and mom that um, pushed us once she figured out I could sing because she didn't know I could sing at first. Mm -hmm. And so this lady didn't show up for her solo one Sunday. And she said, I was about three years of age. And she said, I looked at her and said, well, I want to sing. And my mother made all of our clothes. Wow. Okay, she was a seamstress. So she wasn't just at home cleaning and cooking. She made everything that we wore. And wow. so I had this, these beautiful little you know, gowns that she made us look like baby dolls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had the ruffles and all this kind of stuff. So imagine this little girl with pigtails, little bitty ones that, you know. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, Mommy, I can sing. And she's, I said, I want to go and sing. The lady didn't show up. She said, you can't sing, sit down. And I was like, I can sing. She's like, you cannot sing. <laughs> sit down. And I defied her and jumped up in my little pan leather shoes and took off up there <laughs> where Is that my right? father was and you know and started singing if a robin can say thank you you can do it to everybody have a praise his name daddy picked me up wow you know and i always had this thing of putting my thumb down the back of his shirt uh -huh. And I, when he would pick me up and put me in his arms, I'd take my finger and put it. I'd hold on to him. <laughs> so if he tried to put me down, I'd still be holding on to the back of his shirt. <laughs> and, so, and so he's sitting there, he was just jumping me up and down. I said, "Look at my baby singing." Yeah. And my mama sitting there fanning. Lord, I didn't know this girl could sing. <laughs> and I mean, I've been singing ever, ever since. since. Wow. Yeah. You know, you just never know how your gift will be given birth. And uh, obviously, from an early age, <laughs> you knew that you could sing. Oh, yeah. and, and, and you know to defy your mom and say no I'm, I'm going to sing and run up to the to the platform and begin to do it uh, that's you know that's something else that's <laughs> and something she else. told me this you know mm -hmm. years later she's you know when people ask her you know how do these little girls start singing I mean because they get up and sing like grown women in church and she said they just 
start singing. And <laughs> the father would sing all the time, or he'd hum, or he'd whistle. She said, now, he didn't like them whistling. She said, but then Marianne would get around there and she'd go, <whistles> and he'd go, I told you that's for men. <laughs> Women don't whistle. <laughs> so she said, but they all started, you know, we mimicked our father. Yeah. Because he yeah. was a great influence. And we mimicked our mother because my mother loved to make clothes. And she loved to make those clothes tapered and, mm -hmm. you know, to look nice. And they call them first ladies. I call her the only lady. <laughs> no, Not just the first lady, but the only. The only one. Oh, okay. Come on now. That's I don't you know, ain't no first ladies in here. <laughs> this is, this this is, is the lady. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. So you don't mind defining things yourself. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one thing my father did, uh, and my mother did as well. They made sure that we as women had our own opinions, mm -hmm. and um, that we were able. And see, my father was 44 when I was born. Okay, all right, Daddy. Forty-four. And my mother was seventeen. Do the math. Remember, I said he was a preacher. Come on. <laughs> well, I, now I have to admit, I'm not going to try to stomp with things, but Mary kind of stomped me on that. One. Really, Mary. You know what? And I didn't know because my dad looked like a young man. Uh huh. You know. Most of my life, I had no idea my father. The age difference. The age the difference between the two of them. So yeah. I had no idea he was 27 years older than my mother yeah. until probably I was 16 or 17. And I think we had something at school, and he had to put his age down on the paper or something. And you realized? <laughs> and no, I didn't realize until the teacher said something. She said, "Are you sure, uh, Reverend Griffin?" This is your age? He said, <laughs> he said, yes, this is my age. And my mother was like, <clears throat> <laughs> and my mother had to put her name down, I mean her, her age, age down. Well, yeah. And that, that's when I realized, I'm like, wait a minute. What? Yeah. <laughs> was like, and that's when I found out their age difference. Other than that, I didn't know. Right, yes, right. Because he looked great. Mm -hmm. Now, your, your dad passed in 96. He did what? the day after my 28th birthday. The day he after was in a revival, uh -huh. and uh, he came to a birthday dinner that we were having the night before, and he prayed over the cake, and he said, no, in case I'm not here, um, well. I want to do this now. And my father never said bye. He mm -hmm. never said bye, see y'all, you know, he always said see you later. And when we got back to my place, and he got ready to back up, he said, okay, baby, Daddy's going to say bye. And I didn't realize he had said wow. bye until I saw him driving off. And I said, wait a minute, bye. And mm -hmm. so no cell phones back. You know, he right, didn't right. have a cell phone and all that kind of stuff. So I tried to wait till he got home. And I called and I called and I called. And he wouldn't answer. So um, everybody told me they talked to him that night. I didn't get a chance to talk to him. But the next night he preached his last sermon, turned around, looked at my sister and said, it's finished. And the Lord just allowed him to transition. He just went to sleep. Wow. I mean, just right there in the church. Interesting. Wow. But they gave me consolation with my father because that's what he prayed. Mm -hmm. Lord, let my last hour be my happiest hour in death. Give me an overcoming faith that would cheer up my soul in a dying hour and then take my spirit on home with you so I can praise your name through ceaseless ages. Your mm. servants pray. Amen. That's how he ended every prayer. Wow, <laughs> that is amazing. We're going to end this edition of the Phil Phelps Show, this segment rather, of the Phil Phelps Show. And we're going to be back in just a moment, so you guys stick around for more with Miss Mary Griffin. The tempest is raging.
Incomparable Mary Griffin. Welcome back to the show, Mary. Thank you for having me. You know, it's such a pleasure talking to you. It's such a pleasure getting to learn more about who Mary Griffin is. When we were talking on last evening, uh, I learned so much more about you. I realized there are so many layers to Mary. I was thinking I'm coming to interview a songstress, uh, but I learned so much more about her in the process. Uh, now, you went to Grambling State University. Yes, I did. Uh, on a music. On a vocal performance vocal scholarship. Vocal performance scholarship. And from that. That's where I started. That's where you began your career. Not to mention you started at an early age and sing. Exactly. Yeah, but, but it culminated when you went to Grambling State University, I guess I want to say. Huh? It did. Um, I, was, I was actually given a partial scholarship to Northeast Louisiana okay. University first. And that was because of Donald Inslee, which was you know one of the teachers in music mm -hmm. at the high school. My father moved us to Monroe, Louisiana, my senior year of high school. I went to school in Delhi, Louisiana. Okay. And um, senior year, he moved us to Monroe. And so I knew nobody in my senior class. Okay. And learning, you know, they're learning me, I'm learning them. And uh, <laughs> I took choir, and Mr. Inslee was like, okay, so you have this beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. So I want to I wanna see, he said, do you have any aspirations about going to college? And of course, you know, every parent wants, you know, their child to be able to go to college. But coming from where I come from, my parents didn't have the money, you know, to even consider that mm -hmm. to go to college. And he said, I know you will benefit if you went to college. So... I'm going to help you get into the Allstate Choir. And so what he did is a couple of days, you know, out of the week, he and his wife would have me to come to the house and he started training my voice to be able to sing for Allstate Choir. And that's classical music. Okay. And um, that wasn't going to work too well with my dad because my father did not let us out of his sight and he picked us up every day. We didn't ride school buses. Not after Rayville, Louisiana. I used to get beat up all the time. They'd run me home. Really? Oh, uh, and he, he drove us to school for um, 16 miles every day from Rayville to Dale High to go to school because wow. I would, you know, kids picked on me. But they picked on me in every school I went to. So, so you just couldn't get away from it. And I don't know what it was. They didn't mess with Teresa. But they love to pick on me, and I was the oldest. I was like, well, look like, <laughs> look like you know, you would bother the younger ones more right. before. But uh, my father was was really, you know, he was like, they're gonna keep messing with you, so I'm gonna drive you to school, uh, to another school. Mm -hmm. And the superintendent, daddy persuaded him, and I'm not gonna tell you how he did it, but he persuaded him to okay. let me go to school in another district that had nothing to do with the district that we lived in. My father could be persuasive when he wanted to. Is that right? Now, I wonder if that's where his daughter got that from, her persuasiveness. Very much That so. would be you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but his persuasiveness is a little bit different from mine. <laughs> Although I can't be persuasive like that, too. But, yeah, he took us to school there. And then so when Mr. Inslee started training me, mm -hmm. I knew Daddy wasn't going to let me go to his house. Even though okay. he had a wife, it wasn't going to happen. And mm -hmm. so I said, well, Mr. Inslee, can we like do it at school? And then that way he could actually pick me up at school. Right. And he said, well, the thing is, I don't want the other kids, you know, yeah. thinking there's favoritism. Mm -hmm. He said, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just lock the room up and we'll have somebody. Because he was going to make some sort somebody was in there at all times to protect him, which you're supposed to do. Absolutely. He's a smart man. Exactly. And so, <laughs> and especially with my dad. <laughs> And so um, he started training me, and I did get an all-state choir, and I did win a scholarship, and I got a partial scholarship to Northeast Louisiana University. And I had a, a, a metropolitan bar uh, baritone trainer, singer, Dr. Louis Neighbors, who passed two years ago in Rome. Okay. They're doing an opera. But mm. he trained me um, for two years. Okay. And vocal performance, and he was a hard, hard teacher to okay. have because he was a metropolitan opera. Which only made you better at what you do. Exactly. And um, in that, when I had my son, um, he was very disappointed that the first semester I was naive and that I had...
gotten pregnant, but my father was adamant about me going to school, so he wrapped me up every day mm -hmm. and after I had my son. And he made me go to school until I had him. He picked me up every day from school, yeah. took me back from my classes. He was there when I got out of my classes wow. to take me back home. And when I had my son, I had the little time, but you know, country folks will make you come less. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. Well, <laughs> don't wash your hair, you can't do none of that stuff like you right. have, you know, mumps or something. So he was like, okay, you're going to take care of this baby. So this is what we're going to do. Daddy going to wrap you up because we need that body to go back like it was before because you're only 18. And we need you to look wow. like you did before. So he wrapped me every single day. Yes. And so wow. I had my little cabbage in my bra because I was breast, uh, trying to breastfeed, but my son wouldn't take me, you know. So oh, okay. <laughs> I had my cabbage. I'm sitting, I'm sitting in, in, in class smelling like cabbage because, you know, you can smell it coming up out the bra. <laughs> Come on, huh? <laughs> because he didn't believe in taking the pills that doctors gave mm -hmm. you to dry the milk up. And said, okay. these are old remedies that older people knew that if we still stuck to those things today, a lot of women would not have breast cancer mm -hmm. because you can't depend on a pill to dry up something that is a natural thing mm -hmm. that a woman's body is supposed to do and she's supposed to be breastfeeding to these children at least two years of age. Uh -huh. So my father made sure I had cabbage, you know, in my breast uh, thing, my thing, you brought, thing, you? Bra thing. <laughs> you know, he made sure that, you know, pumped every morning he did uh, my father and that, that's that. really interesting because most of the time moms are the ones well, my mama, that tends to do that type of thing that's my mama that. was taken care of by him too see my okay. daddy my daddy took care of my mother that way with all of us wow daddy was some kind of man yes daddy, daddy was some kind daddy and was raised else. four girls now the mm -hmm. four girls all sang every one as of us well. and he'll give us our notes uh -huh. he said Mary this your note Teresa this your note Adrian this your note I need you get in. You just get in where you But she was the baby. Okay. But okay. she has the highest voice of all of us. Is that right? She's got the highest soprano voice of all of us. And me and Teresa's voice were kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Adrian had kind of a tenor voice that was a lot deeper. Okay. Here. And we all harmonized. And right. So once he gave us the note, and he goes, mm hmm. And we're just singing. Okay. Or he go, oh, Jesus, gave me water. Oh, Jesus, gave me water. Jesus, gave me water. We had to come say wow. right behind him, right behind him, the that way he did. vocal tap dance is what yeah, I call it's a, that. it's a tap dance. Yeah. And we learned how to tap dance around him, under him. Right. And to harmonize. That is phenomenal. Now, you talked about your sister, Teresa. Yeah. Now, Teresa, from what I understand, has a song right now. That's right. That's Number on the 14 Billboard on the Billboard Trust. Trust. Go, Teresa. I'm going to be right behind you in a minute. Uh-oh. Look at that <laughs> up-and-coming gospel CD. For uh, such a time as this. For such a time as this. You know, I'm looking forward to it. Now, you know, honestly, I had a chance to hear some of the vocals on that, on, uh, and the tracks on that particular album uh, prior to this interview, and, and I'm really blown away by it. And and I was yeah and oh yeah definitely definitely and uh, the first thing I thought was is Mary writing from her own experience are these things that she's gone through and we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we come back in just a moment I'm going to uh, get a little bit deeper with Mary and the the music in this particular album coming up all right we'll be back with more in just a moment stick around. Karis, this is what they say, Karis style. Not that we perish. How can the love sleep here? When, 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 when each moment. All right, welcome back to this exciting edition of the Feral Felt Show with none other than Miss Mary Griffin. Welcome back to the show, Mary. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Mary, I know that you're just like a stick of little dynamite <laughs> because I've learned so much about you. Uh, and I, I say that a stick of dynamite uh, because of uh, your resilience, number one. You've been through some, some tragedy in your life. You've dealt with uh, a fire 
at an early age, where uh, your family lost everything, everything yeah. uh, that you had. I know that had to be tough for you as a, as a young girl. How old were you when you had that experience? I think I was about 11 or 12. 11 or 12. Yeah, we uh, had a house in Rayville, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And it was like the little, uh, you know, the little, now they call them uh, the HUD houses. Okay. You know, and I think that's when they first started building them in little communities where, you know, uh, people who were on lower income okay. would live, mm -hmm. and uh, they go by your income gotcha. to, for your rent. And so, um, I think it was like a Saturday, a, mm -hmm. a Saturday, because we, uh, we were all at home. My dad wasn't home. He was actually putting shingles on the church. Okay. Uh, in in um in Tallulah, I think, maybe. and uh, First Kingdom, and I think he was gone. He left early that morning, and so we were there, and I was in a tub, and <laughs> gone out to get something out of the washroom in the garage, and I opened the garage. You know, once you let air through a place. It, it breathes. It's, the, it, yeah. it breathes, uh -huh. and so it had been burning for for a minute before we even knew that the house was on fire. Okay. And so when I opened that, it must have spread through the roof because I was getting ready to get in the tub. Wow. So I went out to the washroom, picked something up, went back inside, uh -huh. went into the bathroom, and by that time I heard my mother screaming, saying, "Everybody get out! The house is on fire." Okay. And so everyone got out of the house. And we watch our house burn down, and fire literally, truck literally it. lost everything. My uncle's car was under the garage. He had to like knock it out of out of gear because back them old cars back then you could do that. Uh -huh. Knock it out of gear and push it back, you know, so the car wouldn't get burned up. Get burned up in uh -huh. it. And uh, we just stood out there. I had a towel and a bonnet on my head, and watched <laughs> everything go <laughs> go up in flames. Yeah. My father didn't even realize the house had burned up when he got there. Until <laughs> there was nothing there, and he had wow. to drove up in the yard. He was trying to figure out why everybody was standing out. You know, all the people were outside, and we stood there and he looked at the house. He said, and he never came home that early. Uh huh. He said, "This is what was going on," because he said he had a feeling something mm. had happened. You know, no cell phones, and so yeah, nobody called him, and we lost everything and ended up uh, staying with um, a deacon and. A mother of our church okay. from Green Grove and happened that my mother and she were best friends and so we would go to their house on fourth Sunday mm -hmm. to eat after because daddy didn't want to eat from nobody so <laughs> daddy had some strict rules yeah daddy got food and he's funny about food no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we would go to their house all the time and this mm -hmm. woman was my Aunt Nisi I called Aunt Nisi and we stayed with them for about four months until my father, uh, by being a carpenter, mm -hmm. um, found a house. Then it was like fixed it, it up and yeah. And of course, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't the best of houses. But you know but what? It, but that's what they could do at that time. And that's all he could do. Yeah. And you know what I loved about him is that he tried to put the amenities in it. Okay. To. Uh, to make my mama happy, because yeah. he knew that she was going to be real sad, real sad mm -hmm. about where we were going to be living, and it wasn't what what we had before. Mm -hmm. And she she tried to um, keep him from uh, seeing her disappointment. Yeah. But it was it was hard for her, and it was it was hard for him because he couldn't afford anything mm -hmm. any better than that to put us in at the time. But, you know, God is faithful and God is, God is so good because at the end of the day, um, we made the best of it mm -hmm. and moved to Monroe a couple of years later and um, we found another old house. <laughs> but it was at least in, in, in what we call the city. Yeah. And it was on a little corner. It's a little greenhouse. And I met probably, her name is Zebby Grayson. She's a lawyer now in Atlanta. Okay. And I met my friend uh, Zebby there. And she had a father that was much older and a mother that was much older. Mm -hmm. And she was the only child they had between them. So we yeah. had something in common. And we're going to get a napkin for you. We, oh, had, we thank just you. had a moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. And you know, we just never know how different topics and conversations will 
uh, tap into an emotion uh, like this has done uh, with Mary at a very tragic time in your life. Um, and uh, you are certainly a survivor. Uh, that's something that I that definitely know about you. Uh, and out of those ashes, Mary Griffin has risen, you know. Uh, and not only did you survive that situation and circumstance in your life, but um, Katrina. Katrina yeah. is what brought Mary to Houston. Uh, and uh, that was a very tough time for you, being on, on the road for all those hours trying to get here. Yeah. Uh, and the different things that you witnessed and experienced in your journey, uh, trying to survive and, and, and get out of town. Um, I know that had to be tough for you, but all of that has made you the resilient person that is sitting right here before me today. Exactly. Um, I remember when I had my son and I didn't know what I was going to do in college. Mm -hmm. And I was actually singing at a wedding and the Vice President of Student Affairs saw me and said, um, are you in school? And I said, yes sir, I got a partial scholarship in Northeast. He said, hmm, what if we offered you a full scholarship to a historically black university? And of course, you know, I had to ask that. You had to ask that. <laughs> so, my father was like, a full scholarship, and where is the school? You know, mm -hmm. he said, Grambling. And he was like, well, how far away is that? And, you know, I said, Grambling's like 45 minutes away, Daddy. And he was like, well, I can't pick you up from school every day if you're 45 minutes away. Uh -huh. And I said, well, you don't have to pick me up from school every day. I'll, I, I'm, I'm going to stay on campus. He said, no, you're not. You got a kid. How you going to do that? <laughs> Got to consider that. Huh? And so I had to talk to the school, and what they said that they would help me get an apartment. And okay. That was really not selling well with them, because that meant you were. What, really had your chance to. Well, at that point, yeah, because that meant <laughs> yeah, you got your chance to be alone, <laughs> and that is not going to happen. But eventually, you know, my mother was able to talk to him, and yeah. Gremlin uh, cultivated the career that I have right now, yeah. and going to a historically black university with. Uh, being the and, and I didn't know it until later. I was an ambassador for the liberal arts department. I just thought, okay, y'all gave me a scholarship. Now I got to work for it by going with the president and telling how I was giving this scholarship uh -huh. to a uh, historically black right. university. Right. And they had me to open up for all of the acts like Nancy Wilson, President's Concert, yeah. uh, Phyllis Hyman, Anita Baker, Mickey Howard, the her, and you know to be able. Open up for Mickey Howard back then, and she had this song. I've you. been up and I've been down. I've had. I mean, it was mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. then they um, brought in Whitney Houston's um, publicist, Regina Brown, at the time. Okay. For a pageant that that that, that we were having down in uh, for Body Classic. So okay. every year, you know, in order for sponsorship to raise money, they have a pageant. Right. And so Dr. Johnson put me in that pageant. He said, because you know, you can get your car, you know, da, 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 da. And I was like, no, Dr. Johnson, I, I, I wouldn't be, I'll sing, but I can't be in the pageant. But Dr. Johnson didn't know I had a son. Okay. And I was just a little girl to him. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so Mrs. Moss, who was my chaperone all the time, she said, well, baby, we're going to have to tell him. We got to tell him we got a baby. <laughs> and so they had to take me into a meeting and sit me down. And he was crushed. He was like, oh, Mary, why didn't somebody tell me you had a baby? You just a baby. You know what? Mm -hmm. He said, well, I just want to make sure she's singing. So Regina Brown saw me singing. And they, we had just given Whitney Houston an honorary uh, doctorate. A doctorate at, at Grandma State University. So... Um, they were doing this thing where Oprah was putting on this big fundraiser in Chicago on the top of the Ritz Carlton. And they had BB and CC whining on the show, Sissy Houston, Dion Warwick, mm. um, Whitney and Luther Vandross sang on it. And they brought me in mm. as a Gremlin, you know, representative right, to, right. to put me Ambassador. in. And the, Dr. Johnson knew how to work it, baby. Yeah. And he was, you know, this is our, you know, gift and da 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 so somebody would help me because this whole thing was to get me help into cultivating my career. Absolutely. And you know what Mary, we're going to talk a little bit more about that okay. cultivation in just a moment when All we right. come back with the uh, Feral Felt Show. You guys stick around. We'll be back in just a moment. Sky Trues! Sky Trues Custom Eyewear has taken the world by storm. In only eight months, Sky Trues has gained the eyes of many, including celebs like Big Sean, 
Little Flip, Destiny Child, Soldier Boy, just to name a few. Through custom design, Sky Truths can put your imagination on your frames. I bring to you the next big thing in Houston, Sky Truths, created by Golden Boy, the musician, the artist, the entrepreneur, and grassroots marketing genius. Be inspired, Sky Truths, custom designed frames. Sky Truths! Welcome back to this edition of the Feral Felt Show with my awesome guest, none other than Miss Mary Griffin. Welcome back, Mary. Thank you so much. You know, I'm really enjoying this dialogue. I had no idea I would enjoy it so much. I, I knew I would enjoy speaking with you. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier when we were talking, there's so many layers to who this woman is. And just to peel back some of the layers has been very interesting for me. And just to see the emotion, the raw emotion that, that's coming out of you just based on some of the dialogue we're having, it's really refreshing because it's real. And uh, I definitely wanted this interview to be real. We were talking about uh, your your career, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the experiences that you've had, the people that you've had an opportunity to work with. Uh, I know we touched on uh, a lot of different names mm -hmm. uh, along the journey. Who are some of the other people that you've had the pleasure of working with? Now, I know one of the main people is certainly Miss Patty LaBelle for 13 years. Is mm -hmm. that right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Now, how did you actually get around to working with Patty LaBelle? Um. Same, kind of the same way God just brought, you know, the right person at the right time. Mm -hmm. I, as a matter of fact, uh, the young man's name was Sammy McKinney. Okay. And um, never met him before a day in my life. A friend of mine from New Orleans, when I used to sing at the club, uh, I was singing in a cabaret club in New Orleans after college. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I like to call it cabaret. Cabaret. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Uh, this young man whose father's an actor and his mother owned a production company used to come and hear me sing. His name is Robert Dukey. Okay. Um, he moved to L.A. and I had given him a CD. He let someone over at SAG, that uh, Terry O'Neill, hear it. Okay. Terry O'Neill was a lawyer at SAG and he had friends that, you know, in the industry. So he yeah. would let different people hear, hear the music. And this one man uh, knew Sammy. Mm -hmm. And it went through five different hands before wow. Sammy took it to Patty and <clears throat> said, you know, you got to hear this girl's voice. And this is a song that she did first, but uh, it was given to Celine Dion, but it's also on her record. Okay. And Patty heard it uh, two years prior to even calling me. Yeah. And so when she uh, uh, removed her band of 20 something years and she started over and started with a new crew of people. This is Patty we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. In 2002, she got rid of her old band of 20 something years. Wow. And she decided she wanted to have a different look, a different sound. And um, she already had that band in place, but she called me because she told Sammy, from what he told me, he was in the hospital at Cedar Sinai. And he told me in Cedars, I'm hearing everything deep, deep, and uh -huh. you know he's barely breathing. I didn't even know him. I had I never met him. Wow. When he called me, he said he told me who he was, and he was calling for Patty Labelle, and she's looking for a backup singer. I said I'm seeing backup, and I'm signed to a label. Mm -hmm. He said, Well, I told her about you. She loves your voice, and she wants to call you. I said, Are you serious? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Patty LaBelle. This is Patty LaBelle. <clears throat> and so when I hung up the phone, you know, I was like, I turned and I looked at my now ex husband. I said, This is a guy calling me about Patty LaBelle looking for a backup singer. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't sing backup. Then he looked at me and said, Well, it's not like Jessica Simpson called you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> Whatever. It's a legend in music. Patty said, She's LaBelle, a legend. Right? She's an icon. And I said, but I'm signed to a label and I'm working. Why would I go do this? He mm -hmm. said, just see what happens, you know? Right. So Miss LaBelle called me and she was in Atlanta and she was so funny when she called. She said, honey, I'm taking a bath right now because I'm getting ready to go on stage in a few minutes, but I need you. <laughs> <laughs> then she was like, she said, this is, this is Patty Patty. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, yes, ma'am. She said, okay, you country. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> but I'm cooking gumbo, as a matter of fact, for my family. I'm at home cooking. So uh -huh. she asked me to sing something. 
She said, sing, just sing something. So I so sing like what? She said, anything, just sing something. Mm -hmm. And so I started singing, I don't know about tomorrow. She said, okay, now, skip all that. Get to the high part in there. <laughs> Get you to know. the beat. All and right. so when I said, and I know, I know. Okay, that's enough. Will you be available <laughs> tomorrow evening so I can let my tour manager and my manager hear you sing? I was like, yes, ma'am. She said, I'll be in Houston, and we're going to call you around the same time tomorrow. Yeah. And so she called me, and she said, would you sing that song again? And I said, yes, ma'am. I sang it. And she said, okay, you're hired. Would you? And I'm going, wait a minute. I wouldn't. I, I'm just singing. Wait, hold oh, I got three kids here. I got my son, my stepson, and my niece that I'm raising. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. <laughs> to myself. I'm going, she said, okay, can you be on a plane tomorrow to be in L.A.? Because we got a show the day after. Just like that? Just like that. And I was like, well, I got to talk to my husband. Her and talk to your husband and call us back and let us know. And so I sit down wow. and I talk to Richard. Richard was like, yeah, that's Get you packed up. Get you out of here. I said, but it's a tour. I said, what are we going to do about these kids? Oh, we got it. We can get a man. And she come on in. She da 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 da. Yeah. And so I got on a plane out in Monroe, Louisiana, which means you got to take three planes to get to L.A. out of there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, which I was no stranger to because mm -hmm. I've been signed to this label. So you've been flying here, flying there. Yeah. The and, and I said, okay, so. What am I going to do? I got a record that comes out next month. Mm -hmm. And I said, and Pat is asking me to go on the road for a tour. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what? It took them this long to actually put this record out. They've held me for this long. I'm going to go and do this tour and make me some money. Okay. And what's the worst that could happen? You know, mm -hmm. it is Pat of the Bell. So I got to <laughs> L.A. and um, John Stanley took me in. who's was a musical director at the time. He was a background singer. Okay. So he took me in for 28 songs. Ricky Minor had put the band Ricky Minor. Together. Ricky is all over the place. How about Ricky wow. is from the street, the same street that I, when we moved to Monroe, Louisiana, from Rayville. Ricky is, he lived, grew up. Uh -huh. A block away from the house that we moved no into way. on Pippin Street. So when I wow. met him and I said I was from Rayville, he went, you don't know nothing about no Rayville. I said, I lived on Pippin. He said, ain't no way you lived on Pippin. He that's said, that's crazy. the street I lived. Wow. And so, you what know, are the chances? What were the, chances, the chances that the, 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 the person putting all the musicians together mm -hmm. for Patty LaBelle was someone from, 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 from my hometown? Yeah. yeah. And so... You know, I was scared because I've never seen backup. So, uh -huh. you know, you're so lead singers are different from backup singers because you don't hear the blend. And all the, the only singers I had to worry about were my sisters mm -hmm. when we did harmonies. Right. So it was a different thing. And it was 28 songs. And it was 28 songs. But wow. Patti LaBelle is a trip because she flew in the next day after I did that whole rehearsal. Uh -huh. And this is the first time I ever cried. Okay. You know, when we had to do the music in front of her, mm -hmm. I was trying to throw the tears back because I was afraid I didn't know these songs. I did not know them. And it takes me a while to catch, uh -huh. to remember words. Mm -hmm. And I knew none of her music. I didn't know any of her music. Really? Who sings Patti LaBelle music? You can't sing like that. You can't sing like Patti LaBelle. You married Griffin. I don't care who you are. <laughs> <laughs> like that yeah. but what she hired me for was a beautiful thing because although I've cultivated a lot of different sounds over the year yeah. a Patti LaBelle sound is one thing that I never dared to even come close to to even try okay her music because it's it's a different voice mm -hmm. and it's a head voice yeah. and her head voice is stronger than most people natural completely because okay. it's strong yeah and so what she ended up really teaching me is the aesthetics of okay. performing how you because i performed for years mm -hmm. but how you're able to project even when you're tired 
because yeah. she suffered with diabetes for years, mm -hmm. and her voice was just as strong still. And mm -hmm. when I learned, you know, like in, in, when we were doing the rehearsals right before, she never got a chance to even hear me do her, her show. The next day when she got in, she made them play a joke on me. She said, come downstairs. So I went downstairs and I had on, I said, well, I got to put get dressed. They were like, no, you don't have time to get dressed. I had on silk. I remember to this day, silk, mm -hmm. uh, gold pajamas. I had braids in my hair back then, so I had them in plaits. So when I took them down, it was curly. Uh -huh. And so I had my plaits and I had my little furry house shoes. Because I like the little dainty house shoes. Right, right. And so <laughs> I get down and I said, I don't want to meet her, my first time meeting her mm -hmm. in this. And so they were like, oh, don't worry about it. She'll be fine. And so I sat there and. It took a while, it was 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So well, I'm going to start getting ready because it took me three hours to get ready for anything. We learned uh -huh. today. <laughs> 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 I, was, I was like, I got to go get ready, honey, because it took me a while to get myself together. I had to lay stuff out and have it all, you know. And they were like, well, she'll be out in a few minutes. And then you got another Stokes go in and they come mm -hmm. out with dresses. Somebody else going to, you brought Derry Rutledge, who does. Oprah Winfrey's makeup now. Okay. You okay. know, he go in and then you got assistants running back and forth. A lot going on. Yeah, and I'm like, well, what up? And so finally Patty comes out with her Christian Dior, you know, beautiful um, uh, uh, robe. Mm -hmm. And she had this big, wide hat and shades on. And she walks out and she says, she walks out, she goes, where's the girl? Is the girl <laughs> said, well, I thought she was down on earth. Uh -huh. And so I said, I'm over here, ma'am. Come to me so I can see you. And so I came over to her and I stood. She said, Uh, she's too short. I said, I put on heels, ma'am. Baby, she fell out on the floor. She fell out on the floor <laughs> laughing. She threw her that hair one way to change the mother and jumped on my back and said, I got you, I got you, I got you. <laughs> I was like, what in the hell is going on? She broke the ice. Everybody the was ice. laughing. Yeah. She broke the ice with me. Mm -hmm. So she was like, you going with me the rest of the day. And so we went to go see Sammy, the guy that was her best friend. And I didn't know. Who had made the connection. Who had made the connection. Yeah. And we got there and you had Denise Rich. You had every Natalie Cole. Everybody that was wow. a diva. He knew them all. And they were all in there. And so Miss Pat came in. And when she got there, you know, Miss Pat said, well, Sammy, she said, I'm going to have little Mary here to sing you a gospel song. And so I sang uh, Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. And Miss Pat was, she was like this, you know. Yeah, Pat style, huh? Yeah, she said, I'm done. She said, I'm done. When them people start coming in, you know, in the room, and you got all of these, you know, women that I've admired for years in the mm -hmm. business. And they were in awe. What was that like for you? What did you feel like at that moment? I was blessed. Lord, how did I get here? And how is it that you've allowed me to meet so many of these people without going to L.A. and trying to be around them, without asking to be mm -hmm. in this place? How is it? And it's just, it's a blessing. Yes. And to know, to, <laughs> to know that she... She called me. Yeah. She called you. Chosen. And Mr. I don't have people over the phone. Mm -hmm. So you were supposed to be here. And when we got to that concert that night, uh, which was at the Greek. Okay. Miss um, <laughs> Miss Miss uh Miss Pat talked about Sammy that whole that whole night because it really she had, she didn't know you were sick. Mm -hmm. And that really bothered her. But she pulled me out to sing, and I didn't know the music. She allowed me to have a music stand and lyrics up there. She said, two shows, Miss Thing. After that, that stand goes. And so I was like, yes, ma'am. You know, she said, just playing with you. You can learn it. <laughs> 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 so, this is, this Which was good for you because yeah. it gave you an opportunity to, to, to break that ice because you probably had a level of intimidation. Because oh. this is the diva, Miss Patty LaBelle. Uh, and so I can imagine what you must have felt in that moment. But you know what? That's the beautiful thing about having a gift. Oftentimes your gift will make room for you. Needless to say, your gift definitely made room for you. We're going to find out a little bit more about that gift and how it made room for her when we come back 
with more Mary Griffin. We'll be back in just a moment. Right here. Right. You know, and 
I'm a goddess at this point because we all got God in us. When God breathed everything that was in God into us, mm -hmm. we became gods. I don't care what nobody else thinks. How can you breathe something into something and it not, not, not be a part of who not you are? Not be a part of what and who you are. Mm -hmm. So we are all gods. We just have to tap into that place, yeah. and it will manifest itself as you cultivate that. And ladies, we're goddesses. <laughs> and we have to start showing that carrying to men yourself as such. and carrying yourself as such. Because there are times, you know, we, we grow up, we do stupid things, and we don't want to go back and look at that stuff. But it's a part of our past. We evolve with time. There you go. Just like your music has evolved. Just like my time. music has evolved. You know, and like I said earlier in the show, it's been difficult to, to pigeon, you know, I can't put you anywhere because your music is so eclectic. That would be a good way to say it. Her music is just eclectic. And you're using your music right now for something that's very important to you. Yes, I am. And, and I want to segue into that. Okay. Your son, Orlando. Yes. Now, Orlando is 30 years old. He'll be 30 September 1st. He'll be 30 September 1st. And your your current uh, CD release... It's for such a time as this. For such a time as this will actually be benefiting Orlando with what has taken place in his life. And Mary, if you don't mind, I'd like for us to talk, take me back to what happened with Orlando that's uh, caused this, uh, your, your new CD release to be so important right now. Okay, well, uh, 22 months ago, October the 3rd, uh, my son went to do a charity uh, exhibition fight mm -hmm. for the Children's <laughs> Cancer Society. And they actually uh, picked a young man, and that young man was a street fighter. And he had never had any mixed martial arts. And my son has been in mixed martial arts since he was three years of age. And uh, he studied Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, and he was vegan. No Healthy. Yeah, healthy guy. That, you know, went all the way to nationals for um, bodybuilding mm -hmm. at 19 and won all, all the way up to nationals and then placed in nationals. And it was all um, natural mm -hmm. for him, that he did, and I, and he did I, it without training. Yeah, wow. And I saw pictures of him. Yeah. And uh, this dude was, I mean, just, I mean, the epitome of health. And they, and, I mean, super fit. Super he fit. did the 16 hours a day, every day. Mm -hmm. And um, my son went there and did this fight. They let both guys know this is an exhibition. So they're in pads, because, you know, when you do MMA stuff, you don't use the pads where they're in pads and everything. Mm -hmm. This young man had been warned twice, an illegal move. The third time, he took the back, and he was 6'5", Orlando's 5'10 uh, and a half. Mm -hmm. This young man, and I have the picture. Yeah. He takes my son, the back of my son's head, and he rams it into his knee, which breaks, it, it broke both of his orbitals, he crushed his nose into his face. His nose was crushed there like that. I was there with him for 19 days. It took me 10 days to get him a surgery. He had to sit literally set up every night. And I had to listen to him struggle to breathe every night. They didn't want to take him because uh, he didn't have any medical insurance. So the, the hospital that, they didn't even take him to the hospital that night. He had to get someone to take him to the hospital, okay? That, for me, is cool. Mm -hmm. And my, my son walked in there with two broken orbitals. He has an implant behind his left eye now that uh, I had to get the surgery for because they didn't pay for that. Uh, we had to do a rhinoplasty surgery. And the only reason the rhinoplasty surgery went through is because it was a mother who was the head of this. Um, she was a, a, a Hispanic young lady. Mm -hmm. And she saw me struggling to get this surgery for my kid from the doctor who was a plastic surgeon over surgery mm -hmm. there. And she said, I'm, I got four girls at home. She said, and I'm going to push this through. She said, I'm just going to push this through. She said, he doesn't usually do surgery unless you could pay all of it. Mm -hmm. She said, but if you can just pay half of this, and which means that you'll have the hospital uh, part of it where they need you to pay. She said, just make sure that you could get that part of it. She said, I'm going to push it through over here, and that's what she did. Yeah. 
and she pushed it through so my son would be able to breathe. Because he couldn't, he, he was sitting up every night with pillows and still at this point his bones are shifting in his face so he has to sleep sitting up. Because if he laid back with those bones not attached to the left side of his nose, because this when they put the implant in, this part, it didn't attach. It didn't attach. So, he's been in pain like this for 22 months. And um, we took, took him to a doctor in Glendale, California. And there are two doctors there. Uh, one is a Yale and one is a Harvard graduate. Um, and my son researched all of this. He researched the doctors that were going to have to do this in order to do it less invasive. Because what, what they want to do... Not these two doctors, but the doctors that really didn't care whether he had a scar or not. They want to go from ear to ear, take his skin down from his face, cut this all the way around, and then put pin, put these screws in here, mm -hmm. and then put screws in here, and then you know take the skin and you know put it back mm -hmm. over because he has to have skeletal surgery to reconstruct his face. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a, I had my baby. Your only child. My only, even if he wasn't my only, yeah. but he's my only child. And to know, you know, no drugs, you know, no jail, no alcohol, no nothing, no tattoos. And I ain't saying any of that is negative. Yeah. But his body is his temple, and he was getting ready to trial for March, mixed martial arts for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And they had given him, you know, said he could come. And this happens. Yes. And now we're in the year of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And he's been in a house isolated for 22 months. So I put this record out for such a time as this for two reasons. I promised my daddy I was going to make a gospel record. And I made all of those hymnals because these are the songs I grew up with. Right. For such a time as this. Because this music is lost to our generation. Absolutely. Right now. And, Absolutely. and, and our generation <coughs> sang them. We know them. But this generation doesn't. And anytime I'm singing a song in church and you don't know how to play a hymn, and you young, I got a problem with that. I got a problem with that. That means somebody's not teaching what should be taught. So I want to take it back there. Mm -hmm. And this will benefit my son's surgery. Every dime that I make off of any of this mm -hmm. is going to go back into making sure we can get this $58,000 surgery that you gotta pay cash for because let's face it, you don't you don't get insurance for plastic surgery. They won't take insurance. They want cash, mm -hmm. and they wanted twenty five thousand dollars up front, and then you pay the other twenty uh, twenty three the day you walk in for the surgery. Mm -hmm. And so they will set you a surgery date with the first twenty five thousand. Okay. And then with the next twenty three, when you come in on that date, you got to give them that money. The balance. The balance of that. And so that would take care of the surgery, the uh, anesthesia, the anesthetic doctor that does anesthesia, mm -hmm. and the two doctors. Then we got to pay for the hospital visit. Then we got to pay for the recruitment for six months. Because I've been taking care mm -hmm. of him. Uh, all this time. All this time. He can't do anything. And he's alone in isolation. He does not want to see anyone. And even coming outside, I think, affects oh, no, him he, as well. He, yeah, he can't. He gets excruciating he headaches. Gets, headaches are so bad that he can't even sit up for hours at a time. My son reads. He's had not watched television since he was 12. He doesn't watch television. He only wants television in his house. So, I mean, he's not. A, he's one of those people. He reads, and I want my son back. Yeah. And, yes, I have been pleading, and I've been asking for help because... I do a lot of charities. That's the reason why my son did this. Right. He said, I want to do something like what my mother does with her talent. She gives her talent for charity. I want to give mine back. But mine left their going to UMC Urgent Care, yeah. which they wouldn't treat him because he had no insurance. Which I found to be very ironic that UMC, the, the, the actual people that he's doing this uh, fight for, mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't. Oh, they ran like. That was, they that ran was like, such a shock and surprise for me. When I read that. They ran like rats. And you would think that they would gravitate to it because this young man is doing something uh, to help that hospital as it relates to charity. I talked to a lawyer here 
And when I told it was the Children's Cancer Society that I wanted to, to, to I wanted, I said, ma'am, I'm not trying to do anything but get my son fixed. But I don't think I can sue the Cancer Society. I said, you mean to tell me they could leave my child like this and there's no problem with it and he was doing something for charity? Mm -hmm. But you got a problem with suing them? And it took a lot to get someone to take it. And so I got someone to take it in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And I really don't know if she's really taking it okay. or working against it. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not going to wait for somebody else to fix my son. Right. And he's been sitting like this for 22 months. So, okay, if you, if you, know, if you can get something on the back end to help make sure he can live life after life after this that's fine but i want my kid fixed and he not sit like this for another two years so i'm mom mm -hmm. i've been mom daddy and everything mm -hmm. for 30 years it's my responsibility anything that's ever been fixed i fixed it i got a wonderful person in my life that is there to hold me up while we get through this whole thing and i thank the lord for it but it's my responsibility to get my baby mm -hmm. back on his feet. Yeah. And that's what mothers do. A mother's love. A mother's love. And uh, uh, Now Mary, there are ways that people can certainly contribute to helping this cause, not only by purchasing the CD, but they can also make donations through your GoFundMe yes. that you have set up. Can you uh, give us that information, please? Well, we have a GoFundMe set up, and you can actually go to my website at um, marygriffin.com, and there is Orlando's story. They're in the menu. Or you can just go to GoFundMe and uh, go under A Mother's Love, Mary Griffin, okay. and you can donate to him that way. Um, I want to say, first of all, everyone who sees this, I want to say, first of all, thank you and your staff for bringing me in to help me with this. Because when I had, when I had to go through Katrina, I told nobody anything. And no one knew that I had been homeless or even when I went to L.A. to do that stuff with, with Patty. I didn't tell anybody yeah. that I was sleeping in my car. Mm -hmm. And I learned through my sons this time. And it took me a year to do this because I was doing it all, you know, and didn't want to tell people. Yeah. And when I saw that I wasn't going to be able to get him fixed and this isolation was really getting him to the point to where I thought I was going to lose him or I think I'm going to lose him. Yeah. I said, okay, my pride got to go out the window. Mm -hmm. Forget that. Sometimes we got to ask for help. There you I go. didn't ask many for me, but I'm definitely going to ask for help for my son. For her child. Because I would do this for anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, so I said, okay, well, I can give him something for it. Yeah. So let me put a gospel album out here. Mm -hmm. and because that's what I truly know nobody can take away from me. My mm -hmm. love of God. My yeah. trust. My faith. They can't take that. And I said, I think this would be a great idea, and I know my dad would be proud of it. <laughs> my mother would be so, and, and she is proud. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? We are all proud, too. Uh, we're proud and excited about uh, having you on the show uh, to share this story. And, and my goal with sharing the story is to make a difference in the lives of somebody else out there so that they can make a difference in your life. <laughs> yeah, and in your, the, the life of your son. Yes. And when I read the story, there was no way that I couldn't have you in an interview and not discuss it. So thank you for sharing that very intimate uh, information with me about your son. God bless you. I wish you all the best. And I hope that this show has made a difference with, uh, with you guys, that you guys will actually go to that GoFundMe. That's Mary Griffin GoFundMe uh, and, 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 make a, and, and make a donation to make a difference in, in her life and in the life of her son. Uh, for more information on the Farrell Phelps Show, you guys can certainly reach me at Let's Talk About It 12 TV at gmail.com. That's Let's Talk About It 12 TV at gmail.com. Dot com. You can simply also go to our YouTube channel, type in Farrell Phelps. All our information the shows are right there. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this edition of the Farrell Phelps Show. Thank you, Mary Griffin, for being here. Oh, thank and you until for next time. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and until next time, folks, we'll see you then. But I definitely gonna uh, I wanna come back in just a second because we're gonna let you hear a little bit more of Mary's voice. All right? So don't go away. All right, take care. I wanna thank everyone at the Farrell Phelps Show for coming out today and giving me the opportunity to come to your audience and do this wonderful interview. Um, thank you so much for helping me to push this gospel record, which is for such a time as this, 
and all of the proceeds will be going to um, A Mother's Love, which is my son, Orlando Griffin, to help him get his surgery that he needs. I would like to also say to uh, the staff, you have made me very comfortable, and so I'd like to leave you with a little bit of a song that I love dearly. I've had enough heartache. Had enough headache. I have had so many ups and downs. Don't know how much more I can take. See, I decided that I cried my last year. Yesterday, either I'm going to trust you, or I may as well walk away. The stress don't make it better, don't make it better, no way. See, I decided. That I cried my last tear yesterday. Oh, yesterday. Yesterday. See, I decided that I'd put my trust in you. Oh, yesterday, yesterday, yeah, I realized that you would see me through all oh, there ain't nothing <laughs> to hide from my See, I decided, I decided that I cried my last year. Yeah, There you have it, none other than Miss Mary Griffin. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this edition of the Feral Frogs Show. And again, until next time, we'll see you then.